Welcome back, everyone, to part two of our look at Warhawk uh, and the story of the Battle of Shiloh. I uh, want to thank Warhawk for stopping by um, and saying hi and thanking us for checking out the video, and hopefully we're going to send some subscribers their way. Uh, so if you haven't already and you're into the American Civil War, please definitely check out Warhawk. Uh, check out that channel and give them a subscribe and check out some of their videos. They have some incredible detailed stuff if you want to take a look at the nuts and bolts if you're really into this kind of level of detail about the Civil War and some of the battles and even some of the smaller battles that people don't generally talk about. So uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to dive into part two and I don't know if we'll get through the whole thing. Uh, part two is a 37 minute video uh, and you know, you know how much I like to talk so... <laughs> Uh, that could easily turn into an hour and a half, so we may just take a chunk of it at a time. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix it in with some video from my visit to the Shiloh Battlefield a couple years ago. I'm planning to go back, and I actually wanted to go this week for the 160th anniversary, but since I'm going to the Netherlands in three weeks, uh, it just was too much. I couldn't travel twice in one month. Uh, just too much of a strain on the family with everything going on here at home. So uh, I will get there hopefully sometime this year. Uh, I want to do a lot more in-depth look at the battlefield at Shiloh. I only had a couple hours there. so uh, And this was a long time ago. I made this video long before I had this channel. So the quality is not the best. But uh, as we are watching parts of the battlefield, uh, being described, I'm going to try to show you some of my video from those sites to let you see what they look like today. So here we go. This is the Devil's Own Day, part two, uh, but really part one of the Battle of Shiloh itself. If you didn't see part one, which was kind of the build up to the Battle of Shiloh, uh, the link's in the description below as well as the original content creator's uh, video is also linked. So check that out. Here we go. In the early morning hours of April 6, 1862, Union Colonel Everett Peabody, commanding the 1st Brigade of Brigadier General Benjamin M. Prentice's 6th Division, organizes a patrol of three companies from the 21st Missouri and two companies from the 12th Michigan, under overall command of Major James Edwin Powell. Unlike many officers in the federal camp around Pittsburgh Landing, Colonel Peabody with his 1st Brigade positioned in the forward lines of the entire army camp, suspects that the Confederates are up to something. So one of the things you will notice when it comes to the Union armies in what we call the Western Theater in places like Tennessee, there's a distinct geographic difference between the states that you see represented in Grant and Sherman's army, for example, out in the West, and what you see in the Army of the Potomac. Uh, you're going to see a lot of what then would have been the West. So you're going to see a lot of units from Wisconsin and Ohio and Illinois. Illinois uh, and Ohio in particular made up a huge chunk of Grant's armies. Um, Ohio, Wisconsin, Illinois, Iowa, uh, Minnesota, um, Missouri, Michigan, uh, Indiana, things like that. Whereas in the Eastern Theater, you're going to see a whole lot more of Pennsylvania, New, Nor New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, uh, the New England states, things like that. Uh, there is a, a divide in that way. There are some states that are represented in both. The first Minnesota, for example, was all the way over in the Eastern Theater. There were Ohio units in the Army of the Potomac, but the majority of them were in the Western Theater. So the, the states are going to reflect that and had expressed his concerns to General Prentice, who dismissed them. Acting totally on his own authority, Colonel Peabody orders Major Powell, an experienced old army officer, to march down the Sheffield Road and seek out the enemy. Quietly, the Federals file off into the darkness. As Major Powell's patrol nears the Corinth Pittsburgh Road, three quarters of a mile southwest of the camp, they are suddenly fired upon by Confederate cavalry vedettes. Not realizing the danger ahead, the Major hurriedly formed his 250 men into a skirmish line and advances into J.J. Fraley's field. Ahead, shrouded under the cover of darkness, is Brigadier General Sterling A.M. Wood's 
3rd Brigade, a Major General William J. Hardy's 3rd Corps. So, first of all, you have to observe that this is gutsy by this uh, patrol officer on the Union side. It's still, I don't know, I think it's probably 3 or 4 in the morning at this point. Um, so it's early, early morning. It's still dark. And he makes contact with the Confederates. But rather than you know falling back to his original position, rather than sitting tight, he's going to pursue. He's going to go see what's going on. He wants more information. And I give him a lot of credit for that. And you've got these Confederate units. They're getting into position to launch this surprise attack. And they weren't, I don't think, expecting to make contact this soon. And where this actually happens is, uh, is a place you can visit on the battlefield. It's actually marked. So this is where I uh, was at a couple years ago when I visit that spot where that uh, those first shots are fired. And you can see to this day, they've done a good job at Shiloh of trying to make the battlefield look as much like it did then as possible. And so you see, you come around where the, the modern road uh, curves around, and then you see this path that goes where this road was, where the Union was riding down and where they made contact. In early April, and it slowed their advance. And so by the time they got... Uh, within striking distance of the Union Army, uh, Buell's army was only about a day away. And so uh, what happened was a Union Brigade commander in Prentice's division, a man, a Colonel Everett Peabody, without orders, uh, had sent out a patrol of about 250 men in the early, early morning hours of April 6th, somewhere like around 3 or 4 in the morning. And just before 5 o'clock in the morning, they got to this spot where I'm standing now, and three shots rang out and some confederate troops dashed down that road back toward the main lines they were the advanced scouts for the confederate so there you get a little bit of a sense of what that spot looks like at long last the federals have discovered the advancing confederate army major aaron b hardcastle's third mississippi infantry battalion armed with 280 muskets have been thrown forward as skirmishers for General Wood's brigade. At about 4.50 a.m., as the shadowy forms of Powell's skirmishers close to within 200 yards, Major Hardcastle's Mississippians opened fire with a deadly musket volley from the tree line. The Battle of Shiloh, or Battle of Pittsburgh Landing, had begun. And so it's amazing that even though this ends up being this mass assault by the Confederates, it starts with skirmishing between a couple hundred men on either side. Very few units involved at five o'clock in the morning. Most battles don't start at five o'clock in the morning when they first get going. They might have attacks that, that kick off on that time, uh, but a lot of battles don't happen this way. And this, it's pretty unique. For the next hour, as sunlight begins to streak the sky, both sides of skirmishers doggedly trade blows, each refusing to give way. From his brigade headquarters, Colonel Peabody hears the faint musket shots to the southwest. A messenger arrives from Major Powell, indicating that his patrol is being driven back. Moments later, the firing off in the distance doubles in its intensity. The colonel jumps to his feet and immediately orders the long roll sounded throughout the camp. General Prentiss soon gallops into camp and angrily accuses Colonel Peabody of bringing on a general engagement with the enemy. And as I mentioned in my video, you heard me say he did this without orders. Uh, Peabody hadn't been given permission to send these scouts out, but it was a good thing they did because it gave the Union a little bit of notice of what was happening. And unfortunately, uh, in Peabody's case, within a couple of hours, he's going to be killed later on during this fight. A violation of Major General Halleck's standing order, Peabody, mounting on a horse, snappily salutes and is heard to say, If I brought on the fight, I am to lead the van. From his head That's gutsy. He's like, hey, if I started this fight, I'll be right up front. I will be in the thick of this. I, I actually really like uh, Peabody, and I wish he would have survived this battle because I would have been curious to see uh, how things would have turned out for him. Quarters at Cherry Mansion on the opposite side of the Tennessee River in Savannah, Major General Ulysses S. Grant and his field staff are preparing to eat breakfast when they hear the opening shots of the battle across the river. With their breakfast brought to a halt, Grant looks to his staff and says, Gentlemen, the ball is in motion. One of the things you will hear time and time again from people who served with Grant, going all the way back to the war with Mexico, is Grant was ridiculously cool under fire. 
nothing rattled this guy some people are just like that other people they get rattled easily you know um a perfect example would be joe hooker who was actually a really good general but sometimes had a tendency to get rattled when something happened and, and kind of t caught him off guard um some generals just don't get like that and and grant's one of those people i mean just nothing phases this man he could be under you know bullets whizzing all around him uh cannon exploding things are falling apart and things aren't going well and other people are panicking he doesn't he's nine miles away from the battlefield he's way up river he's not even in a position to really do anything and this had happened before this happened also at fort donelson where grant is away from the battlefield when the fighting breaks out and has to get back and kind of take control of things and uh he just hey the ball's in motion let's go they weren't expecting an attack they weren't expecting anything like this to happen but when it does he's just like all right let's go Colonel Peabody advances his troops about a quarter mile south in line of battle and halts on a slightly inclined wooded ridge on a branch of Shiloh Creek. There, Peabody's men listen intently to the din of musket fire drawing closer from the south. Stumbling ahead in the semi-darkness is General Hardy's assault line, some 9,000 Confederate soldiers. Meanwhile, Colonel Madison Miller, leading Prentice's 2nd Brigade, hurriedly forms his brigade on Peabody's left, taking position on the south edge of Peter Spain's field at 7.30. Captain Andrew Hickenlooper's 5th Ohio Battery unlimbers in the northwest corner of Spain field. Now, it, they got a slight uh, typo here. It's Hickenlooper, not Hickenlopper. But uh, Hickenlooper, you might be familiar with his name if you watched my Vicksburg series because uh, Hickenlooper ends up the chief engineer for Grant's army. Uh, and is one of the people most responsible for the siege of Vicksburg and how that plays out and, and how they dig their trenches and dig their mines and their approaches toward the Confederate works. This is Hickenlooper, the same guy. East of the Eastern Corinth Road. And I should mention, too, that I think just recently, um, was it Colorado who had a governor, Hickenlooper, who might be in Congress now or something? It's a direct descendant of this guy. Also anchoring Mills right is Captain Emil Munt's 1st Minnesota Battery placed astride the country road. At about 7.30 a.m., Peabody's troops standing in line suddenly see the enemy emerge from the woods ahead. Confronting the Federals is the right wing of Wood's brigade, along with Colonel Robert G. Shaver's 1st Brigade of mostly Arkansas troops. The opening federal volleys caused the Southerners to stagger to a halt. Some units, such as the 55th Tennessee, even run pell-mell to the rear shouting, Retreat! Retreat! However, within one hour, Peabody's line has been overlapped, and his men fall back to their encampments. So you got to remember, again, we mentioned this in yesterday's video, most of these men who are going to fight in this battle have never seen significant combat before. Uh, this is new to all of them, and so, you know, when you haven't fought in combat yet, you don't know how you're going to respond. And so for a lot of these guys, they're responding. It's fight or flight kind of thing. And some of them are going to flee. It's just the natural human response to being shot at by hundreds of people. Um, and some of them just haven't learned to process and learn to accept what combat is. Although suffering four wounds, Peabody remains on the field, attempting to rally the troops. He suddenly throws up his arms reels back and falls dead from his horse if and i'll show you where that spot where that happens so like i said this is an old video face is really close up there and kind of shaky so well one of the major mistakes early in the battle that general johnston made for the confederates was that he believed that grant's army was arrayed in a uh, north to south position in other words his army was facing west with the Tennessee River to their back and Owl Creek in front of them that wasn't the case they were actually facing south in between the river and the creek on either flank and so Johnston's plan had been to hit the Union Army turn what he thought was their left flank and push them uh, away from the gunboat protection of the Tennessee River and into Owl Creek where he hoped they would have to surrender 
uh, big plans, obviously, and didn't turn out that way. And what he found very quickly was that rather than attacking the Union left, he was actually attacking the right and the center. The place where I'm standing now, behind me was Colonel Peabody's headquarters. He was the brigade commander uh, of the 1st Brigade under Prentice's division. He was the one who had sent out the pickets early that morning. Uh, and had first made contact with the Confederates, and it was actually the 25th Missouri, which was one of the regiments in his command, that was camped in this spot. This is very near to what would have been the Union Center. And behind me, you see that cannon that's standing up. Uh, that is a mortuary cannon, as it's known, and any of the brigade commanders on up who died or were mortally wounded in this battle are represented by one of those cannons, and that is the cannon that represents Colonel Peabody, who was killed on this spot at around 9 a.m. that morning. Fatal bullet had struck him in the head, killing the colonel instantly. At about 8 a.m., Miller's 2nd Brigade is attacked by Brigadier General Adley H. Gladden's 1st Brigade of Joan M. Withers 2nd Division and Bragg's 2nd Corps. So you got to remember, by this point, it's been about a little over three hours since the first shots were fired. This is ample time for the Union to have gotten their house in order and built a battle line and built a strong defense. Uh, and yet, they still are either unprepared or just um, don't prepare properly for what's to come. The Southerners advance under a galling storm of musketry and artillery fire, and soon hundreds of men recoil across the entire southern line. General Gladden is carried off the field mortally wounded. Despite horrible losses, the Confederates launch a second assault at 8.30 with Gladden's men reinforced by Brigadier General James Chalmers' 2nd Brigade of Mississippians and Tennesseans. The southern advance collides with Miller's front, and intense fire consumes the Federal line. And within minutes of this renewed attack, 59 of Prentice's artillery horses are shot down in their traces. 59 horses shot down. And look at this at this point. You've got eight regiments for the Union. Um, I don't know what, maybe three, four thousand men at this point, maybe more than that early in the war. But you're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eleven, sixteen, twenty, twenty-one, and then more back here. So you've got at least twenty uh, regiments. Uh, you're looking at what, four brigades against two brigades? Uh, just not a winning scenario for the Union. Hickenlooper loses two guns, but Captain Munch, although wounded, gets all of his pieces away. The badly scattered Federal ranks from Peabody's brigade stream back through their tents, firing from behind trees and bells of hay. Ambulances race to the rear as frantic soldiers jump on, fighting off their comrades. Surgeon Samuel Ells of the 12th Michigan is tending the wounded when the Confederates suddenly burst into the hospital tent and level their guns at him. By 8.45 a.m., Peabody's 1st Brigade has been rolled up, and his camps were in enemy possession. Panic strikes many of the young Federals from Miller's Brigade as they flee through their camps. The victorious Confederates, under the supervision of Johnston, Hardy, and Bragg, sweep forward. By 9 a.m., Prentice's two brigades, a total of 5,400 effectives, have been swept away, and the Confederates appear on the verge of a great victory in the wooded thickets of western Tennessee. But that's one division. There are six divisions in this army. Uh, they've only just begun this fight. And remember what I said yesterday, if you saw the video, they're attacking uphill this entire time. They've been marching for days through bad conditions, through rain. The Union have been camped here for a while. Now, they've had time to prepare. They're fresh. Uh, the Confederates are attacking over very difficult terrain. At 7 a.m., Major General William Tecumseh Sherman, commanding the 5th Division of Grant's Army, rides into Ray Field with his staff. As he looks south through his binoculars at a body of enemy troops in the distance, he remarks that there might be a sharp skirmish. An officer then abruptly calls his attention to the right. Sherman views a line of Confederate skirmishers emerging from the woods, lining the creek to the west. Throwing up his hands, Sherman exclaims, My God, we are attacked! Shots ring out, and the general's orderly falls dead from his horse, and a bullet strikes Sherman's raised hand. Sherman and again, so here, you know, some some men they get wounded in the first shots of a battle. Psychologically, they're done. 
uh, and Sherman is going to rise to the occasion. And this is where you're going to get start to get the legend that, that is William Tecumseh Sherman. This is the battle as a division commander. He had been a brigade commander in the Eastern Theater. He had been a brigade commander at the first battle of Bull Run. Um, and hadn't performed badly, just hadn't performed, you know, like hadn't done anything of great distinction. Here he's going to start to distinguish himself, and this is where the partnership with Grant's going to begin. And let me show you, I, I did some video right from this spot, and there's a Confederate, bur Confederate bur burial trench right here, and you can get a really good sense of the terrain here, uh, how it goes up and then dips down and then back up again through the woods up toward Shiloh Church. So right here is that specific field, and if you could see through these woods, just on the other side of these woods and up on the other side of a little ravine and then it dips down and then back up again would be Shiloh Church over here to the left. And it's in this area where Sherman is going to be wounded and he's going to make that exclamation about we, we are attacked. Church maybe another 200 yards from where I am now. And you can see why this would have been a difficult attack for the Confederates. First, they would have had to cross that stream probably without the help of a bridge there. For mass amounts of confederate troops but then yeah so there was a stream that i crossed right before this you can see it here uh, and they would have had to cross over that stream in making their attack and then you can see the woods these are the woods they're attacking through shiloh church is just on the other side small ravine and the confederate troops would have had to go down that hill and then back up again to emerge out of the woods to where shiloh church is just on the other side there a so everything you just saw is there's that creek that I crossed going up these woods and then I was pointing in this direction right here. Sherman instructs Colonel Jesse J. Appler of the 53rd Ohio deployed in skirmish line after hearing the earlier shots to hold his ground and then gallops off to mobilize the rest of his 5th Division. Advancing through the swampy thickets choking the valley of Shiloh Branch are the troops of 34-year-old Irish-born Patrick R. Claiborne. His regiments become separated as they struggle forward through the boggy morass. And Claiborne's a guy that in recent years has really seen a resurgence as a popular um, candidate for being one of the best generals the Confederates had, especially in the West. He was killed uh, very late in the war uh, during the attack at Franklin, um, but he's thought more and more highly of it seems by historians as of late. Claiborne himself is unceremoniously thrown from his horse into the mud. Clearing the ravine, two of his regiments on the right of the brigade line, the 6th Mississippi and 23rd Tennessee Infantry, advance eastward unsupported against the 53rd Ohio's position. The two Confederate regiments meet a hell of bullets from Appler's regiment and the rest of Colonel Jesse Hildebrand's 3rd Brigade posted in line to the north. I don't think I realized that the entire uh, group of units that were defending Shiloh Church were all Ohio units. I mean, Sherman's from Ohio, uh, so it makes sense that he would be commanding troops from Ohio. But I, didn't, I don't think I realized that all six of these regiments were going to be Ohio regiments here. Also, severe blasts of Union artillery fired from Captain Allen C. Waterhouse's Battery E, 1st Illinois Light Artillery, deployed in front of its camp on a knoll along the northern end of Ray Field. In Captain Samuel Barrett's Battery B, 1st Illinois Light Artillery, located 400 yards northwest at Shiloh Church, tear huge holes in the Confederate formation. When under the murderous federal crossfire, the 23rd Tennessee breaks and flees and the men of the 6th Mississippi attempt two additional solo assaults. By the time the smoke clears, some 300 of the regiment's 425 men lay dead and wounded in Ray Field. It's and one of the interesting things about the Shiloh battlefield is that it's one of the few battlefields, uh, Civil War battlefields, where some of the original mass graves are still there and still identified. Uh, right here, and probably made up of, of men from these units there in these woods, is a Confederate mass grave. In fact, I'll show it to you here in my video because it would have been the very next stop right there. So there you can see, uh, surrounded by these cannonballs, and there are several on the Shiloh battlefield, but this is one of those mass graves. It's not very big. I don't know, maybe enough for 40 men or so, uh, but it's there. Staggering, 70.5%. At the very moment when Appler's troops are winning the brief, murderous engagement, the colonel suddenly cries out, Retreat and save yourselves! The Buckeyes flee north in disorder, with Appler in the lead. 
falling back across each branch ravine of Shiloh Creek. Appler reforms part of the 53rd Ohio behind the 3rd Brigade of Colonel Julius Wright, part of Major General McClernand's 1st Division, which had been ordered forward to reinforce Sherman's division. Appler's men continued to combat the Confederates for about another hour when the shaken colonel again loses his nerve and orders another retreat. Fleeing northward, most of the 53rd Ohio flees toward the landing. If I recall, I'm gonna, let me look this up because I want to be sure before I say anything. Okay, that's what I thought. Appler ends up resigning after this uh, in disgrace because of how he performed and and how, how he you know kept retreating instead of holding and fighting like a lot of these other guys did. One of the other officers in the 53rd Ohio is Ephraim Dawes. Uh, whose brother Rufus Dawes is famous from the Iron Brigade. Uh, and uh, I think Rufus's son uh, becomes Vice President of the United States. Despite being reinforced by Wright's brigade, by 9.30 a.m., as more Confederate brigades are thrown into the fray, Jesse Hildebrand's brigade begins to fall apart. The defense of Sherman's left now rests upon two artillerists from Chicago, Captain Barrett and Captain Waterhouse. Astride the Corinth Road near the church, Barrett's battery holds firm as its infantry support on the left phase. While Water and another thing I'm noticing here, and this is just one of the cool reasons why I love family history so much, um, I have an uncle, a great-great-great-uncle, who was killed at Shiloh, and he was in the 77th Ohio. Uh, you can see that unit right there. Um, he actually wrote letters home, and I've, I've actually read some of those letters. I've, I've held them in my hand, his letters that he wrote just days before he was killed at Shiloh, uh, talking about the situation and things like that. Waterhouse continues to defend the northern end of Ray Field, southeast of the church. That's such a Sherman quote. I love it. And it's funny, too, because Sherman and, and Grant are so very different. Um, and the way Sherman described it, Sherman described himself as being much smarter than Grant, but that Grant had qualities that he didn't have. Uh, he, Sherman, didn't have. Um, but Sherman, you know, Grant despised uh, vulgarity. He didn't swear hardly ever. In fact, there was one time uh, that he said the word darn, and for weeks it ate at him that he had said darn. Uh, Sherman, on the other hand, was described as one of the best swearers in the entire Federal Army. Initially, Colonel Ralph Buckland's 4th Brigade, occupying Sherman Center, had held both the numerical and terrain advantage in the fight against the left segment of Claiborne's brigade. Even so, when Claiborne's Confederates exploded from a creek bottom, Buckland's line is hit with such a force that for a short time, his men waver. The and, and like I said, this is, this is tough terrain here. You can't tell it from the map, but they've gone downhill into the creek, now uphill through the woods at the enemy who's up on top of the hill. This is a tough, tough attack. Federals hold firm, however, driving Claiborne's disorganized regiments back into the woods bordering Shiloh Creek. At 8.30, elements of the 2nd Confederate Battle Line, part of the 2nd Corps, commanded by the Marinette Major General Braxton Bragg, slam against Sherman's position. Already the southern lines are beginning to intermingle and command line of authority is rapidly disappearing. Brigadier General Patton Anderson's brigade of Bragg's Corps assaults Waterhouse's battery but is subjected to a terrible enfilade fire from Barrett's guns. At 9, Colonel Robert M. Russell's and Brigadier General Bushrod Johnson's brigades of Polk's 1st Corps join in the chaotic fray below Shiloh Church. A lot of people ask me uh, about Florida. Why, why don't I see more Florida troops uh, in uh, the Confederate Army? There weren't that many people in Florida. Florida wasn't the place it is today where it's you know vacation spots and Disney World and Miami Beach and all that stuff like that. There were not a lot of people. Florida was kind of a swampy frontier land. So there weren't that many regiments that were raised in the state of Florida. About to be overwhelmed, Waterhouse's cannoneers hastily withdraw their guns, but not before three pieces are captured. After the collapse of Prentice's division, General Johnston directs five Confederate brigades to advance north and west behind Peabody's captured camp. This mass movement turns Sherman's left flank. 
helps break up Hildebrand's brigade and forces Sherman to abandon his camps. The Union general orders Buckland and Colonel John A. McDowell, whose brigade anchors Sherman's right to Owl Creek, to retire their commands upon McClernand's 1st Division. General McClernand has deployed his division in line of battle along the Hamburg Purdy Road, a quarter mile behind Sherman's initial front. Suffering from a nasty hand wound, for nearly three hours Sherman has put up a stubborn defense at Shiloh Church, a Hebrew name ironically translating as Place of Peace. All right, so um, nah, I think we'll do a little more. I want to at least get halfway through this video. By late morning, the initial Confederate drive is beginning to lose momentum. Many Southern soldiers have stopped to plunder captured Federal camps. When General Johnston discovers an officer looting in Prentice's camp, he chides him, None of that, sir. We are not here for plunder. Observing that he had shamed the man in front of his men, the general softens his tone and picking up a tin cup quips, let this be my share of the spoils today. Serious tactical problems have also developed for the Confederates. Yep. Since the capture of Prentice's camp, the initial sweeping right flank movement has degenerated into a series of massive frontal assaults. Hundreds of men have been killed and wounded in the opening assaults on Prentice and Sherman and attrition is already a serious Confederate problem. The and remember what I said in that other video, uh, the Union are not laid out in their formation the way that the Confederates think they are. There's an intelligence gap here. Uh, the Confederates are expecting a north-south Union formation, and they're going to hit them from the south and drive them uh, toward Owl Creek, but what instead they're facing is a full frontal line that's facing toward the direction the attack's coming from. And so it's much harder, especially because they're kind of rolling up, you know, so the Confederates are attacking from left to right. The left hits first, then their center, then their right. Uh, and that was intended with the idea of, of the direction they were going. But when they're not laid out like that, it throws the whole plan off. So, so this was a, a problem of, it was a bad battle plan to begin with. And then they find that they don't have quite the surprise they thought they would. And even when they have surprised them, the Union put up more of a stubborn defense than they expected. The organization of several brigades have been broken. Patrick Claiborne's and Bushrod Johnson's brigades are shattered in furious, disorganized frontal attacks against the Union right defending the main Corinth Road. Before noon, Brigadier General John C. Breckinridge's troops along with Brigadier General John K. Jackson's brigade slammed head-on into Brigadier General Stephen A. Holbutt's division and John MacArthur's brigade at the Bell Farm. This leaves only Chalmers' Mississippi and Tennessee brigade, along with Colonel James Clanton's 1st Alabama Cavalry, to attempt a sweep around the Federal left flank, deployed on the commanding ridge north of the confluence of Locust Grove Branch and Lick Creek. Commanding the isolated Federal Brigade is a 46-year-old former Chicago lawyer, Colonel David Stewart. Assigned to Sherman's division, Stewart's 2nd Brigade of 30 regiments have been posted by General Sherman to guard the Hamburg Road Ford over Lick Creek. The 55th Illinois Infantry, the extreme left of Grant's army, had pitched their tents in Larkin Bell's Peach Orchard. To Stewart's right, Horvath's division deploys slightly northwest at Sarah Bell's farm, several hundred yards away. At about 11 a.m., Stewart's infantry, unsupported by artillery, received the full brunt of Chalmers and Jackson's attacks. As a result of the initial Confederate artillery bombardment, Stewart loses all contact with one of his regiments. Two regiments holding on against ten. Again, not a winning formula, but give them credit for holding it all which has retreated several hundred yards northwest to a new defensive position behind the camp. And again, you've got some poor command and control here because you've got you've only got three regiments to begin with and now you've just lost a third of your command because he took off and left the other two. Heavily outnumbered, Stuart is forced to retire his remaining men several hundred yards to a prominent wooded ridge located east of his camp. There, under the cover of the trees, he pieces together a stable defense. With his two short-handed regiments, for two hours, this small force of 1,200 men stubbornly contests Chalmers' further advance north. And again, this 
has a lot to do with uh, stubborn defense, but it's also about the terrain. The terrain is even worse on the right side. As you get close to the river, it's really, really bad, and there's no place to have an attack. Finally, having suffered heavy casualties and with their ammunition exhausted, Stuart orders his hard-pressed soldiers from the line. Moving northwest through several deep ravines, Stuart's men retreat to the river road behind Horblutz and MacArthur's men, who now assume full responsibility for holding the Union left. Stuart marches his survivors to the landing, where he obtains ammunition for the depleted cartridge boxes. Each side produces many heroes that bloody day at Shiloh. Colonel David Stuart, finding a pre-war reputation as a scoundrel, would be one of them. All right. We're going to wrap it up right there. Uh, we'll come back tomorrow and do the second half of this particular video because that's a lot to cover. But I hope you guys are enjoying this. If you have specific questions or specific observations you'd like to make uh, about the Battle of Shiloh, let me know in the comment section below and I'll try to address those when we get to the next part tomorrow. Uh, also, a uh, new video up over on the new channel uh, where I share a little bit of my thoughts about why I love uh, football, soccer so much and how I became a fan of teams like West Brom and Rangers. So check that out if you would. Thanks for watching.